Hello. <clears throat> so uh, we're talking today about how Rust gave us a, you know, uh, an edge really in the database space and how Rust really gives everyone an edge. Today, how is everyone getting on? Right. We just need to switch. There we are. Right, fantastic. So let's start. So um, my name is Maxwell Flitton. I'm a software engineer at uh, SurrealDB, mainly working on the Rust and working on the ML integration and the Python integration. Um, and I've written two books so far. One is Speed Up Your Python with Rust, and the other is uh, Rust in Web Programming. So the second edition of that is out. Working on the contract and the outline for the third edition, there's always loads of people who kind of want to add more and more to it. And um, also finishing up the um, Async Rust for O'Reilly, so the Async book, uh, which is Async Rust Programming. And we're getting close to that, but it will be released soon. So um, we actually, you know, thrive on Rust. and you know, I say that software, you know, like, so SurrealDB is pretty cool. Um, it has a lot of really good features. People are raving about it. And I'd love to say that we're all like super geniuses, but actually the reality is we're not bad, but I think Rust is really giving us an edge. And um, you can see this like super scientific graph here. And uh, <clears throat> what it's trying to really tell us is that Rust really gives us that safety and that control performance. So with Rust, when we compile it, it doesn't have a runtime, doesn't have a garbage collection. It's quite suited for embedded systems, and um, Wasm is kind of lo loving it. You know, so WebAssembly kind of has a really nice affinity of Rust. Um, it's reliable and safe, so we can see that it has a, a rich type system, um, and it has a really nice compile checker. And we'll go through that, right? So um, you have these checks for lifetimes and ownership and, you know, memory management on, com on compilation, and it guarantees memory safety and thread safety. I'm going to show you some examples there. And... I mean, it's a modern language as well, and we'll go through that. So the productivity is really good. We get good documentation. We get good tooling, and we get really good um, error messages as well. And people say, like, well, what's all this with safety? Um, <clears throat> Python's safe, right? Python's memory safe. And uh, really what we can see here is this is an example that I always give. And uh, you can see that we have a class here called Dangerous and we give it a value. We pass in a value and we give it to. So we, we create an instance of dangerous. And um, we can see here that we have like a, a map one, so a dictionary here, and then another dictionary. And we insert into the dictionary. So we insert dangerous, the instance of dangerous, into two different dictionaries. Then we update the value, and then we print the maps. And then we print the IDs. And what we can see here is that the value for both of those inserts has increased. And uh, they both are pointing to the same memory ID, right? So that's kind of like not, you, some people don't know that's happening. And what Python has here is this kind of like graph like structure in a way it maps the memory and the variables. And uh, this is, well, dangerous. And it's not even like consistent. So if we didn't do a class and we did a primitive, like let's say an integer, this wouldn't happen. So um, now let's go into uh, what would happen if we did it with Rust. Um, we can see here that we uh, try and do the same thing. We've got a struct that's called dangerous. Uh, we try and insert it into a hash map. Then we try and insert it into another. And we get this lovely error code. And it says, hang on a sec. You try to move this. Um, and then you try to, you moved it so it got consumed into one map. And then you're trying to put it into another. What are you doing here? And you'd have to either manually clone or have a reference. And then you'd have to guarantee that reference. So you can see that it's also very safe in terms of the way you just implement stuff. So memory safety is not the only thing. You know, being safe in the way that you implement code is also really important. And Rust really just kind of knocks that out the park, right? Um, and what we kind of get a lot with when we're developing this is that you know, your development speed is much faster because you're getting all this at compile time. It's not that you didn't do some weird edge case that you didn't test for and you get it live in production. Like you're getting like where you've moved your, your value and you're getting the errors thrown up in your face straight away as you write them. And this is something that's really good. This is something that you really want, right? Quick feedback is essential. 
And uh, we can also get down to like the speed here. And uh, this is a, uh, a case study that Discord did. They had Golang and then they switched to uh, Rust. And you can see which one is better. Right, Rust is better, right? This is this is not really that hard to work out. You don't get those memory spikes. And it's because like Rust doesn't have a garbage collector. Golang does. And, and the sad thing is there's loads of these um, comments, you know, and they were kind of saying, oh, you've got an outdated version of Golang. And the Discord team replies saying, well, we tried a lot of different versions. People kind of ignored that and just kept saying the same point. But, I mean, there's no denying it. I mean, if we look at the research, we can see that uh, Rust is uh, second only to C in terms of memory consumption on the AWS testing. And, I mean, it's blazingly fast. That's the catchphrase, right? People have to say it's blazingly fast. So we've got that memory safety, and we just get that lovely speed as well. And um, this is uh, actually quite a famous benchmark. So it's done quite a few years ago, but you can see that this kind of like the way that Rust runs and the async and how how beautifully it's designed, we can really see it just like punch holes into other things. So um, this one they did, you know, a thousand concurrent requests over sixty seconds, and you can see like Flask Python, okay, got like eleven thousand. We can see Falcon, which is like a slightly faster one. We can say, okay, I've got 14,000. Nest.js, the JavaScript, that got like 30-odd thousand, right? But then you've got the Attics Web and the Rocket, the Rust ones. They're coming up to the millions. So you can see that, like, the difference is crazy. And I, I've seen this as well in my own um, personal use. You know, I, I built med simulation software for the German government, and we built it all in Rust. Uh, we initially had Python servers when we swapped over. It was, like... The, the CPU usage and the memory consumption, everything just absolutely tanked. So the speed is pretty much undeniable in this sense, right? Um, so then we say, well, isn't Rust hard to write? I mean, you know, like, is it going to take me much longer to write in Rust? Is it going to be a lot harder? And then this is kind of like the last bastion of defense for people who are in denial about Rust, right? They'll they'll say, oh, there's, there's a steep learning curve. It's really hard. It's going to be really, you know, it's going to take really long to be productive in Rust, and it's just not true, right? Uh, I mean, you have to learn some things for sure, but once you're past that, uh, it, it's really not, you know, what we're uh, what we're freaking out over. And uh, we, we can go through some of this. So <clears throat> this this is a uh, this is something in Attic's web. Uh, this is like a end you know endpoint. And uh, I, I generally now, once I've got my head around structs and so on, I actually, structs, not structs, uh, traits, sorry, I actually end up writing less code than I did Python code, which is kind of insane, right? So um, we can actually see that we've got a response body here and we've got a JSON data body. And we're decorating them, we're annotating them with uh, these traits, which are serialized and deserialized. So if they pass through, um, if they're a parameter that's passed through into a, uh, a function that needs it, it can fire that trait. And this this like enables seamless integration into third-party crates. You can go as, as low level as you want. So if we look at this function, which we bind to like a server in Attic's web, we can see that we pass in an X, which is like a get configurable variable. And um, what we've done here, we can see that here, is that this is a trait that I coded, and it's like it yields like... Um, environment variables or it yields variables that are configuration variables from like a file sometimes you want this for like testing or something like this and then like i've got a token and the jwt token i've i've implemented the from request trait, which is out the box from attics web and it fires a load of uh custom logic straight away this is middleware right i've returned straight away like not authorized if there's no token we can't or we can't deserialize that token or, you know, it, it brings it into here. And I pass in these environment variables because that's going to be the secret key. And then we've got like a response, an HTTP response. I've got this custom error, right? And I've implemented the two requests that Attics Web has provided. And um, this then means that it converts errors into HTTP responses just automatically. So then when we have this here, this like question mark, this says like it's either going to return a value 
or it's going to return the error as long as the same type of error matches up. So if my check function, which tests the user ID, which I get from the token from the middleware, um, doesn't check out and their session isn't really valid, then it will just return, you know, the custom error that I've done for this check, which would be an unauthorized one. And then like I do this call that's like get tags, which goes to, you know, a server, um, another different server and like comes back and this is all async, you know, so we can swap back. Uh, then I've got like a nice uh, match statement where if I don't handle all the possible outcomes, it will refuse to compile. And then I just return this, right? So we've got some middleware. We can slot it in and out. Our, our errors just automatically handle and return to um, HTTP responses with custom kind of uh, error codes and, well, response codes and error statements. And our structs, we just automatically sprinkle in the traits. So um, this is something that I always say to people. I'm saying like, if they're having problem writing Rust, um, maybe their code is very verbose or it's really hard to kind of, um, you know, switch up your code. So requirements change and you have to make some changes and you're finding it really hard. It's because you're not using traits enough. If you start using traits, it will be insanely efficient the way you write code and you'll be able to just swap stuff in and out. You'll be able to also do mocking with like mock all and so on. You can mock the traits. So also we can say that Rust is a modern language. And uh, what this means is that the tooling is just out of the box. So if we try and do stuff with C or C++, there's like header files. You have to like compile different um, individual files into like certain artifacts, depending on the way you do it and what tool chain you use. And then you have to compile all those. This kind of just, when you create it, you say cargo new, you'll create the infrastructure that has everything. And you can see that we've got some dependencies here and it will automatically just talk to these. Um, it'll automatically just install these dependencies with certain features. And then this is the beauty of it as well. Those features, <clears throat> that means that you don't have to install the entire crate. You don't have to compile that all into your thing, right? And um, we've also got like some servers that I've built as well. And you can see that there's a path and it points to like another um, cargo project, and I've got some features in those where I call memory, and we'll cover those of why, why I've done that. And we can compile those other servers into our binary as well and just use them. So like the, the way in which we build and ship code is also just like pretty seamless. So like when I've got these, uh, these, these extra servers that I'm embedding into my, into my binary, then I can just use them. And, uh, and, and we have these different feature flags. And this is the this is the idea. And this is the thing like maybe behind this concept I'm experimenting with called nano services. And, and this is where we build our servers individually, but then we can compile them into one binary. And you can see here that when we're compiling, if the feature is memory, that means that we're compiling all our servers into one binary. And that means that we can call them in memory directly. So that means that I actually just get the interface that I import from the server that I've that I've now have access to because it's all in the same binary. And then I have like a live runtime and I actually, and this is just another trait that I've, I've developed. And it just does the direct memory as if it's just calling a memory function. Whereas if it's not got memory, so I'm, I'm not compiling it in the memory feature, that means that they're standalone servers. And you can see that I'm actually making the HTTP request, right? That is crazy, right? Just with these compilation flags, you can then just, with, a, with just a few commands, decide how it's compiled. So you can have this same piece of code ingested and called directly in memory as just one massive uh, monolith, which is obviously going to be faster, or you can just spin it out and have it as its own server, which is, you know, and in a microservices, that's... That's amazing. Um, we can also just embed things. So uh, we can just include bytes and stuff like this. There's a few lines of code. So this is obviously a crate, another crate that we use. And um, this is embed migrations. And you can see that like I have these directories that are full of SQL scripts that we use for our migrations. And uh, we embed them into the binary as well. So that means when we move that binary around, it has all the servers kind of compiled into that binary, and it has all the SQL migrations compiled into that binary. And then we can run those migrations. 
and this is <clears throat> this is a Postgres connection, but you can see that we can run our pending migrations. And then in our function, the run migrations function, you can see that we just go through and we run every single one. And here in this example, we have four servers. So we just run the migrations for each one of those servers. And then this is the main. So I then import all my servers and you can see that I can allocate workers to them, right? So what kind of workers I'm allocating to, I'm only allocating one to each server and they're listing on different ports. So this is it, right? You can hit those individual servers, the auth server, the institution server, the tagging server, but then they just talk to each other in memory, which is, again, awesome, right? And we can we can shut those off. They don't even have to run because the other servers can just hit them in memory. If you don't want to hit the server directly, so you essentially have like microservices all just running in one, one binary. And... Uh, it's a lot quicker, right? Because we get a static type checking. So instead of you having to do a test where you see if your HTTP request actually works and you have to spin up these Docker containers or all that sort of stuff, it just wouldn't compile if you didn't call the function right, right? Because we have this really strong type checking in Rust. So when we compile it all into one binary, we know that all those servers are going to talk to each other as well. So it doesn't stop there. Right, so this is what we call a two-layered build. So we get Rust, and this is in our Docker, and uh, then we do some things, and we we do the cargo build release, and then like what we've done is we've mapped every single driver, and and we have a distrolist. Now distrolist is like a tiny image; it doesn't really have anything. It doesn't even have shell access. So that means that if you try and access, if you manage to hack into uh, this distrolist build, then um, it's not going to do anything. You can't even like see the terminal. You can't type anything into the terminal. And this makes it obviously very, very secure, but it also makes it like um, tiny, right? So your compilation sizes are obviously really small. And uh, <clears throat> this is an example of a build, right? So um, we actually just compiled all those servers into one binary. We wrapped it in... Um, um, and then we then we got the Docker, then we got the distrolist image, and then we copy that over. So part of this is cut off because we just wanted to get the size right in terms of this so you can actually see what's being written. But below this, we merely just copy the binary that we did into the distrolist build, and then we just call it directly, right, with all those drivers. So all those servers compiled into that Docker image compresses to 23 odd megabytes, right? Um, when it's uncompressed, we're looking at roughly about 50 megabytes for the whole image. That's that's crazy, right? So we have like microservices system that kind of all talk to each other in memory, but can be deployed individually. And then we can just deploy it in a distroless container with, with no terminal access onto our Kubernetes cluster, and it's gonna be 50 odd megabytes. And then we can horizontally scale them if we want. And we can just obviously have, we can have multiple ones of these pods. And then Nginx can just can just uh, balance, you know, load balance the traffic that's going to them. So what does this mean, right, for SurrealDB, right? Because I, I, I've raved about Rust and... Um, and uh, we really, like, we're, we're a database company. I've given you some examples of how to build web servers because that's kind of, like, the thing that a lot of people will uh, talk to, you know. But then how can we go back to um, how this will help SurrealDB? So, yeah, let's look at this. So, first of all, like, we're going to build... Um, we're going to build like, a, let's say we're going to embed a machine learning runtime, right? Uh, and this machine learning runtime <clears throat> is Onyx. Uh, and we're going to, we're going to install, the, we're going to get the Onyx driver. So we, we have this build and it kind of downloads the whole Onyx uh, machine learning inference. And then depending on the targets that's being compiled for, we're going to get the right Onyx runtime lib. And we're going to include bytes. So we're going to compile the uh, Onyx runtime directly into our Rust binary. OK. And then we've got this thing called a lazy uh, static, right? So this kind of gets, this has a static lifetime. So it's throughout the whole lifetime of the, um, of the, of the program. 
And then the lazy means that it gets evaluated once, it never gets evaluated again. And stuff inside here is just going to get evaluated once. So we've got our library bytes. We write it temporarily to a file. We set our environment variable. Then we get an atomic reference counter, you know, which will this this makes it thread safe, so you can have multiple atomic references to to it. And then we build our our environment, a machine learning environment, a machine learning inference environment. Then we remove the file, right? Because we don't want to have that lying around, and it's still in these bytes here. So that means that when we ship our product, we have machine learning inference just directly embedded into our static binary, or into our Rust binary, sorry. Uh, and the person doesn't have to, you know, uh, install any machine learning runtime. Uh, it doesn't have to set up any pointers. It doesn't have to work out where its library is and make sure that, like, it's pointing in the run right thing. It works out the box. And we can do this because we have the include bytes and we have all this memory safety and we have all this just working with just a few lines of code. That is insanely powerful. Um, and then you can see that we have like the differences in terms of like how we set it up. So we're, we're setting up with CPU, but we can set it up with a few other things uh, later on. <clears throat> so this helps us actually build really good products. So we're now working on the Surreal ML file, which is like our own file. We're still using like the Onyx format, where there's no point rewriting that, but then we're having metadata around it. And we integrate it with PyTorch, and we've also got some sort of like transpiling with um, sklearn as well. So that means that you can get your, your Python, and um, we, we're also building the Python library. So this Python library has Rust bindings under the hood. So that means that Python developers can import their sklearn or their PyTorch models, and we will convert them into this real ML file format. And then because we're using these bindings, they can also be run in Rust, and they can also be stored on um, the server, you know, the machine learning, the, the, the database. And it has that inference runtime just automatically baked into the binary. Um, this also gives us a lot of advantage on how we actually, you know, deploy SurrealDB. Because again, we're using Rust, right? Rust is awesome. So we can compile it in Wasm and it can run in the browser. We can just run it embedded. So it doesn't have to have any kind of like port allocated to it. Or we can run it as a server or we can run it in the cluster and we have our own Surreal QL. And yeah, the, the engineers are good, right? I'm not saying that we're bad engineers. You have to be good engineers to enable this. But also, like, we wouldn't be able to do this if we were using other languages, right? Rust has just is really given us such a strong edge in this sense. And um, let's look at something, let's say, fearless concurrency. People say it's a bit of a tagline, but, but no, we actually do have fearless concurrency with Rust. So here is... Um, a function on how we actually build our own custom async runtime with small. And we use a queue and we do that lazy static evaluation, right? And this is like a, a spawn task. And we have these generics. And these generics, as long as they've implemented the future trait, then we can accept them. As long as they can be sent and they have a static runtime. Because the thing is of async is that you're polling it. It's, you know, it's being polled by the executor. You may not. You have the right to never await on that on that future. So what a lot of people don't understand is that they think that you have to do a wait in async Rust to execute it. If you do a Tokyo spawn task or a, or a spawn task, this this is a custom function that you can build. But if you spawn a task, it's getting executed in one of the threads, right? One of the thread pools, and then you go about your day and you do other things, and then the await is actually there just to say like, right, I'm going to block my main thread until I get a response from this. And um, you don't always have to do this. You can just do, do an await straight away, but it will give the Rust uh, the ability, the you know, the, the program to switch context and get another one. Because an async function within itself is, is itself a task. So what we have here is that we have a queue and we use the Flume queue here. And then we have a thing called runnable, and we have to convert some, you know, a task to a runnable. Um, this gets evaluated once. We return the transmission because we transmit it because we want to be able to send tasks to that queue. And then we spawn our own thread. 
and then we do a catch unwind and what that catch unwind does is that it means that if there is any errors we catch it you know because we don't know how someone's going to code their their async code they, they might code it with tons of unwraps we don't want to break our uh, async runtime we can have multiple threads that all listen to the same thing we can we can do task stealing we can have multiple queues so we can have high priority queue low priority queue um but this is essentially safe right the run times are are there we've also got to ensure that certain um traits are implemented before they can actually pass in then like we send so we send our runnable to the queue right so and 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 then with that we get the task which is kind of like the handle we schedule this on the queue and then we return the task which is essentially like a handle that you get and then you will wait on that right that's your own custom runtime and i've tried to break these runtimes uh, i've especially done it because as i said i'm i'm writing the um o'reilly book for async rust i've tried to even go into unsafe and stuff you have to really try hard to to make these unsafe so just think can you think of any other language where you get this this isn't a ton of code right and it's safe and we can do all that multi-threading it's amazing so we can also see we can get out of the box async runtimes as well so people may have heard of something like tokyo um and Tokyo in itself is uh, just, yeah, everything's out the box, but we can still build stuff. So we can, this is like the customality that we get with, with Tokyo. So we can kind of say like what happens when our threads park. We can say what, how we keep the threads alive for so long. Um, we can even see how many ticks that we get before we actually accept new um, tasks from the queue, you know, the workers. Um, and we can do the amount of blocking threads, the amount of worker threads. This is bad. And we can do just, again, lazy evaluation. And then we can just import that anywhere in our program. And we can just use that async runtime, which, again, the flexibility is, is crazy, right? And Tokyo goes even further in a sense where you can actually do local sets. And this is definitely something that we're covering. Um, local sets is where you can set aside specific threads. And then you can say, look, I'm only going to, I'm going to assign this task and I'm going to shoot it into this thread to be processed and it won't go outside the thread. So that means that you can, you can actually have local thread um, memory that your tasks can access. So you don't have to have arcs and mutexes everywhere. You can, you can have like four threads and when you send a task down at thread, there's no task stealing. So you lose out on that for sure. But then that means that like that task can have access to the state of that thread. And uh, I mean, if you're just caching things or you, you, let's say you're doing database transactions where there's all those different layers, you don't need arcs or mutexes. Right? So that is, that's crazy, right? You get that much freedom, that much safety. And this is just out the box. Um, we can go even further and say that we've got a high priority queue and a low priority queue. And you can see here, this is just, again, out the box Tokyo. And you can see that we give two worker threads for the high priority queue and do one worker thread for the low priority queue. And then we even have the thread names and so on. And the cool thing is that out of the box as well, Tokyo will just sleep or park its worker threads when it's just not, you know, um, receiving tasks and it's just not running, which again is like, pretty powerful, right? So that means that if your low priority, you know, runtime is just, just not accepting things, it will just park the threads. And this really brings us to the end, right? There's lots of talk about how do we get people to adopt Rust. Um, I've even been to meetings in London where the Rust Foundation has had talks on communication, you know, discussions with the group of people that are invited on how do we get people to adopt Rust. And actually, I have a very different attitude here. I say, I don't care if people adopt Rust, because Rust is so awesome that with the evolutionary pressure, the companies that use Rust will just outperform the companies that don't. And I, I think this is just, the proof is in the pudding. And uh, you can see what's happening with SurrealDB here with this adoption. Yeah, we've got good developers, uh, but we are a database in Rust. 
And I really don't want to be another database trying to compete with us writing it in C or C++. Because the way, the way that we can iterate, the features that we have, the safety that we have, and the fine-grained control just means that we have a huge edge. And, uh, and this is what I say to people constantly when they say, how do I get XYZ to adopt Rust? So how, how can I try and improve you know, Rust uh, in terms of the standing in the community? It's like, just, just give it time. The companies that will adopt it will just outpace the ones that don't. Uh, the, the advantages are just so obvious and huge that you, know, you, you don't have to be an evangelist. <laughs> which sounds a bit weird because it sounds like I'm being quite evangelist myself, but uh, I think I'm already preaching to the choir in this sense. And uh, that is kind of it for our talk. Um, and hopefully I've excited some people. Uh, is there anybody who really wants to have any questions? Okay, yeah, so um, we do have a question, how to start with Rust. Um, I do highly recommend that you um, in you can go on the Rust Playground. So if you just Google Rust Playground, you can type whatever Rust code you want in there, and it will just run. Installing Rust is also pretty easy. If you just Google install Rust, there's like one command, and it will just install. Um, <clears throat> then you have the cargo stuff there you know like the cargo run that sort of thing um and then there's a free online community rust book that will cover all the basics um and it will cover like lifetimes and you know how to and type checking and all that sort of stuff um and also as well like the rust reddit community is also pretty good in terms of they're, they're always quite um quite nice so we got another one um this is exactly why I chose yes. Yeah, I, I yeah I I agree. I, it's you know, Rust is. Uh, I I think projects that that have just adopted Rust will will be there. Like um, I can't name names yet, but like uh, some mega like bioengineering departments and so on have contacted uh, us in terms of like how to get communication between medical devices and it's again it's because rust is just so safe at this and so performant um so why do we use flume for your channels um there's different ways in which you you can there's different reasons why you use different channels uh so the tokyo i mean it depends what you're doing right so if we're just doing standard async tokyo obviously if you're doing a tokyo runtime tokyo obviously does a good thing flume is um very good for just like stacking up tons of requests like it's a, it's a it acts like a kind of queue uh, i mean all channels act like a queue but flume unbounded doesn't really have a limit it will just keep consuming until you actually run out of um memory essentially to actually store so there's no more memory left on the device and then that's where you can no longer store any anything in flume uh so if you see like the small documentation they'll generally use like flume as the incoming um, channel for handling uh, incoming async tasks. So, want to use as a central DB, each of search here. So, uh, yeah, you can um, you can use it in uh, as a central DB data analysis, some relational data. Um, you, it depends how you want to do it. I'd recommend if you want to use Surreal DB. Um, you you just do the brewing or whatever which one you want to do and um you can then kind of just do localhost uh it, you can also as it, it it's got like different it depends what language you're doing because we've got different kind of like bindings and then we also do the embedded and it's also got like memory as well so just pure memory so you can also use it as like a cache um so, uh so so does does surreal db have ml features uh they are coming for sure so the ml features so we we that that code example is like we've embedded the onyx into the binary um we then are doing it so it will store an infer ml and it's gonna it's got some like 
meta data around the ml as well so it'll have like a version and a name and then what happens here is that means that you can actually call it in sql so we've got our own custom sql function that's coming so that means that you can use it in your queries and uh, the cool thing about that then is that you could say like you've got two versions of like a certain like machine learning model and you could say like calculate the inference based on a b c column uh for this version uh version one of let's say your your model and then the next one is like version two of your model and then you can see like differences so it's like machine learning queries in this sense um which is uh really good for quality control it also means that you don't have to like infer at the actual time so a big problem i've seen in machine learning is that running machine learning models for inference and so on can be quite expensive. And I mean, it depends what your machine learning thing is for. You could take the data offline and then you can just run it locally on your machine and, and do the inference and see what the differences are. We're trying to do the basics right for machine learning um, because I've had, I've worked with a couple of machine learning companies and um, getting the basics right, like version control, making sure that there's metadata around that will do normalization so the normalization parameters and so on are all stored with the with the model. That sort of stuff I think is like more interesting. It's kind of more essential uh, and it's more useful for the average user than us chasing like uh, the latest hype and trying to chuck chat GPT into it and so on. Um, so uh, great presentation, thank you. Where does SurrealDB fit in? in a uh, gen ai context uh, gen ai is very computationally expensive we could look into it into the future but um we have to generally consider like um we have to we have to be very careful with like uh, does it you know like take over database transactions um and we are looking into ways in which you can actually configure so all that async stuff that i showed you and how we can like configure the the threads w there is a possibility where we can enable users to say we're gonna allocate like uh you know two threads to heavy computational stuff and then three threads to just like processing transactions and then we can park those threads and so on as well but that's gonna have to become we, we're gonna have to look at the customization because somebody who just wants to use surreal db as just a database doesn't want to get the kind of you know um they don't want to like sacrifice their thread pool if they're never going to use machine learning in that sense um but yeah, we, I mean, if you're interested in Gen AI, we do have a Discord and uh, we we do take suggestions because we're still quite a close-knit team. We're on that stage where, you know, when we, we still kind of like, we listen to the community quite a bit, that sort of thing. Um, so it, if you've got kind of passions and suggestions for that, definitely definitely drop them there and uh, we can look at the, the possibilities. So um, what strategies would you suggest for safeguarding against DDoS attacks? I wanted to expose Surreal directly to authenticated users um, and a live query game. Uh, so D DDoS attacks, uh, I'm, I'm not a security expert. Uh, so I, I think my, uh, my off the cuff kind of comment probably wouldn't do it justice to be honest um i mean I, I could just say that because we're using rust it's gonna be very performant but uh i i'll have to kind of talk to some other people if you again shoot us a message on the discord i can ask the right people who are doing the stuff on the security because we do actually have people that are dedicated to that So we've been trying to trying out Surreal to store vector embeddings. Uh, currently, WebSockets max frame size is limiting us selects with the max limit of 15. Are we using the wrong tool? Um, I think this is just uh, growing pains. We are actually talking internally about uh, how to actually improve like uh, the WebSocket. Uh, so. <clears throat> We, we want to improve the performance on that. And you're using the Python SDK. So I'm just going to ask you one more question then. There's a bit of back and forth. Which Python SDK are you using? Are you using the pure Python SDK or are you using the Rust with embedding Python SDK? 
Mm. I think there might be some, I guess there's delays in streaming. So we have to, so I, I guess I can continue talking until we get that response. Um, so with the Rust Python SDK, we are working on the async, which there is a thing with that. Uh, the pure, I believe. Okay. So um, then with, you, with that, that's just native um, WebSockets, pure Python WebSockets. So it, we that is uh, something that will be on the server side, and it is something that we are looking into like quite promptly, to be honest, um, because it did come up in our tests recently. So we are testing, you know, the uh, the speed and the resilience of SurrealDB, and the WebSockets did come up. So we are actually allocating resources to that right now. Um, in terms of the Rust SDK, it's kind of getting there. I'm actually writing that myself, um, and I think I've solved the async. So that's called the it's the beta version, um, and it's going to be a couple of days, and we'll hopefully have. Uh, stable beta version which we can then test we there was a bit of an issue with the async rust talking to the async python but i think that's solved now and then i is there any other questions that's Yeah, thank you. Uh, you've been a great uh, audience, like uh, really nice, informative questions. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, hopefully we see some really cool things that you've built. And, um, and hopefully we can support some great developers in this sense.